Hello traders, this is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. For today's strategy video, I want to extend our conversation that we've had recently about how global monetary policy seems to be shifting back towards the dovish. Uh, and by that I mean we've seen the most uh, accommodative central banks like the ECB uh, pulling back on the language that is usually associated to a central bank that is trying to acclimate the the markets, the, the, the economy, to the reality that they are going to essentially plan to normalize in the sometime distant future, uh, and by that I mean maybe 3 to 12 months, uh, but that they are intending to do so. Uh, that is on one extreme. Then we have on the other stream the Fed, in which last week we also uh, learned from the minutes or the transcript from the last rate decision for the Federal Reserve that they were easing back on the pressure, the tension to continue with their steady pace of rate hikes. Um, so it is a universal sh downshift in monetary policy, and this is why I have added a average here for global, uh, but the implications are uh, not just relative. All right? We're not just talking about the Fed versus the ECB. We're talking about the collective influence that this can have on the markets. And uh, the point that I made when we were talking about this previously is that a collective downgrade in, in monetary policy is not necessarily a good thing. Historically, it has proven uh, a We'll call it profitable thing for the markets, and that we saw the assumption of volatility drop and the reach for speculation, the reach for yield uh, rally. Whether it be uh, encouragement or a necessity thing, that's up for debate, but that's the relationship that we saw in the market. However, now it comes with a negative, it comes with a detriment. And the detriment is that if monetary policy is already at the extreme lower end of the curve, we're talking about a, uh, a policy that has led to extraordinary balance sheets, right? unprecedented amount of support in the financial system, such that these are essentially crisis level efforts. And they are. They are crisis level efforts. They were implemented because of uh, perceived crises in the financial stability and then an economic uh, malaise. We are still seeing some of these programs expand, and some of them significantly. So this is still in crisis setting. If they are unable to normalize, rather than being seen as a positive, this carries a very negative connotation that there is actually something wrong. The economy, the future for the economy, the uh, health of the financial system, something is amiss that not only can we not uh, uh, ease back from some of these extreme crisis era uh, support structures, uh, but we need to maintain them for a much longer period and perhaps even extend uh, some of the softer language suggesting that there's more needed. So something is very much amiss. And rather than support speculators' constant reach into complacency, this starts to unnerve traders. Why are we uh, sticking around with this? So, in turn, the question starts to shift, how do we treat this in the markets? How do I treat this in investment? Well, for one, it certainly does undermine the confidence that we have in some of the, the assets that have performed or outperformed the most. Things like the S&P 500. Uh, where, uh, by so, uh, many's calculation, my own uh, being a risk-reward index that I look at from a global yield collective divided by FX volatility, because it's a global measure of risk, um, seeing something that is way off of value. We have these markets, we have these indicators that suggest that uh, there really isn't a good value to be had in just maintaining the complacency, playing the opportunistic trade. There starts to become a need of actually finding something that can speak to value beyond the comfort and the support that can be offered by central banks, especially given that they're, they're perceived effectiveness has substantially dropped. Returning to this effectiveness of monetary policy uh, measure, it is substantially dropping. I should have an add an average here because it would be somewhere on the order of this. All right. As that drops, we start to look at assets more 
uh, constructively. We look at assets as being which can avoid issues like the extremely low yield that is a feature, uh, a persistent feature of our broader markets and what can we look at that doesn't necessarily have to depend on these extraordinarily low yields? What can I look for that has uh, instead opportunity on uh, face value? All right, or price, uh, and still isn't extremely expensive or overdone. Well, looking at the comparison of different uh, quote-unquote risk assets uh, from the low that we set back in the, at the great financial crisis uh, nadir at uh, March 1st, 2009, so I picked the beginning of the month, um, U.S. equities are not <laughs> the most uh, deep value that you're going to find. In fact, are the most extended and, and expensive. Global equities, which is the, the darker, duskier blue line here, is no better. Emerging markets, perhaps, are not at their 2011 peak, uh, but nor are they particularly cheap. For their their standing, and this is a, a pace thing and uh, certainly a, a reflection of the uh, measure of the barometer of value, but um, high yield and carry trade are perhaps less extended. All right. But then you have something down here, commodities. Commodities which are a very economic oriented asset uh, that really do reflect the, the optimism of growth or pessimism of contraction. Uh, you have, in just these pure price comparisons, uh, less of that intensity already priced in. All right, so in here, in this case, where returns, which are extremely low in markets, uh, traders are not willing to scramble over each other just to get a slight percentage of a percentage uh, rate of return, um, they're really looking for an assessment of value. These are not it. Uh, most of these financial oriented assets, uh, assets that have been heavily skewed uh, by the influence of monetary policy, which has been a boon in many regards, but it has been a bane in terms of true value. Currencies are collectively also uh, under pressure. And going back to that monetary policy, collectively monetary policy has shifted lower, but even if we take the most hawkish of the currencies, the, the Fed-based U.S. dollar. Uh, and if we were to completely throw them off course of any kind of additional uh, tightening, they still have that four rate hikes that they've already uh, got under their belt. And that provides something of a benefit. But we're talking about a median rate of 1.125% per annum. That is not a meaningful rate of return. Traders are not going to scramble over each other to, to push money into the U.S. simply to make 1.125% additional return per year. So there is not a, a strong motivation to shift all assets over to the dollar. It's far less likely that the dollar gets the same kind of uh, swell that it had in 2014-2015 in anticipation of the Fed's tightening cycle because the advantage that it uh, initially received from this comparative monetary policy doesn't exist anymore. We've essentially played it out, and the collective view becomes more transparent. But what happens when uh, we're seeing a downgrade in rate forecasts and thereby value associated to financial assets in dollars, in euro, in yen, in pound? the four most liquid currencies, and including that, you also have the carry currencies like the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, all of it drops. Where do you go when you don't have an opportunity to invest in uh, these most liquid currencies and regions? Well, there are very few alternatives. Uh, and for those that immediately jump to Bitcoin, that just happens to be more, one of the more popular assets. It's extremely volatile. This is not where most quote unquote investors are going to go. Instead, they'll go back to one of their favorite assets, gold. All right, gold. If you were, if you were trading during the period of the Great Financial Crisis, so I'll go up to a weekly chart of gold. Uh, during that period, where all the major central banks were committing to massive easing efforts, rate cuts, uh, and or stimulus programs, we had a massive appreciation of gold. 
All right. So the uh, we'll we'll go from the same benchmark from the risk uh, side that I, I had called earlier. Um, so we'll start with essentially March the first, two thousand and nine, and we'll go to the peak that uh, we crested at two thousand and eleven, and we're talking about a hundred percent plus increase in the value of gold. Now that. For gold bugs, that is the pinnacle of performance for their market, uh, but it required a very particular uh, condition. It required no focus on yield, because gold does not provide yield. It's not a yielding asset, because it's not a financial asset, so it's a physical asset. It required also a funneling of capital to this particular metal, that would not route to traditional equities or bonds or even high yield investments uh, because they're all financial assets. You have to uniformly devalue uh, assets around the world, all these financial assets, that we can't see, let's say, oh, well, we'll say that UK and US financial assets drop, but we still have an opportunity to invest in Japan and Eurozone assets. All right, we need all of those to drop all at the same time. In those conditions, you will get an ideal funneling of funds into something like gold. And if we are seeing a downgrade in monetary policy views, and in, a, in essence, we're undermining the future possible returns in yield terms for the assets of these major regions, these financial centers, that's going to be something that motivates people into gold. Now, to what intensity depends on how much commitment you're going to get to uh, anchoring monetary policy into the future. But it is worthy of note that not only are we seeing this shift lower, but the top event risk this week is the Jackson Hole Symposium for the Fed, uh, hosted by the Federal Reserve, specifically the Kansas City Federal Reserve District. And they cover a lot of the crucial uh, considerations of monetary policy at this three-day meeting. If we get from the major policies, as the central banks of the world, that they are committing to backing off and undermining the modest hawkish expectations that have arisen in the past weeks and months, that could set the groundwork for gold to make another run uh, to substantial highs. I wouldn't project all the way to 1900, but uh, certainly it can set the ground uh, for uh, progress. So the first technical measure of progress is going to be whether we can actually overtake 1300. Yes, 1955, uh, or sorry, uh, 1295 is essentially the uh, the triple top that we have to work with. But the psychological implications of 1300 are going to carry a lot of the stops for shorts and entries for tar uh, for uh, for long positions above that that critical level. Um, that's your first test, and then obviously whether we can make progress beyond the July 2016 high, and then obviously on to much more substantial open air levels. Then we get into the question of whether monetary policy is definitively, is truly and definitively uh, downshifting and thereby conferring value into this physical asset away from things that depend on yields. Now, add to this the possibility of risk aversion, which gold is a safe haven asset. And yes, in terms of monetary policy, if we see a downgrade in monetary policy, it's going to be interpreted as negative for risk trends because there's not much more support you can wring out of uh, backing off of future rate hikes. Then that risk aversion, if you get it from things like the S&P 500, is only going to compound the appeal of gold. So going forward, gold might be one of the most well-set assets given the uh, convergence of monetary policy and risk trends. So keep an eye on it. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next strategy video tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.